Thank you, Mike. Uh, first, I'd like to apologize to those of you who are used to taking me in 10 to 15 minute doses. <laughs> You're going to have to put up with me for a whole half hour this time. So honey, kids, I'm sorry. <laughs> Earlier this month, I couldn't help but notice how apoplectic people in the media and both sides of the political aisle got when a handful of Republicans delayed Kevin McCarthy's ascension to the speakership of the House of Representatives while they negotiated for things that they wanted. People compared these 20 holdouts to terrorists. Articles were written about how this was some grave threat to democracy. And I know social studies teachers incorporated discussions of it into their lessons, most likely to make Republicans look bad. But it struck me as both comical and tragic that a nation born of rebellion, which claims to value independence and freedom, was collectively hyperventilating over not having a Speaker of the House for the better part of a week. I mean, how ever did we survive those tough times in early January of 2023 when we didn't have a Speaker of the House for four whole days? At least some of you young people will have a story you could tell your grandkids about in the future. What struck me as so sad about this incident is how absolutely obsessed the American public has become with conformity. I thought the whole purpose of democracies and representative republics, which is the type of government that we actually have, was to be free to openly debate and hash out our differences in the public square. Since when were we all expected to just shut our mouths and fall in line with the so-called consensus? There is evidence to suggest that that kind of thinking did serious damage during the COVID pandemic shutdowns, but it appears little was learned from that experience about the dangers of groupthink. On reflection though, I guess I shouldn't be too surprised about the per pervasive demand for conformity in our culture. More astute observers of human nature than me have noticed and commented on this same societal phenomenon. One example is Emily Dickinson. In her poem, Much Madness is Divinest Sense, Dickinson wrote, much madness is divinest sense to a discerning eye, much sense the starkest madness. Tis the majority in this as all prevail, assent and you are sane, demure your straight straightway dangerous and handled with a chain. Dickinson recognized that there is a price individuals pay for going against the prevalent majority opinion. As a high school English teacher, I often get to examine and discuss irony in its many forms. Therefore, I tend to notice real life examples of irony when I come across them. One such example came to my mind as I was pondering today's sermon, which I've titled, for those of you who like titles, Confirm Your Nonconformity. Confirm Your Nonconformity. Many years ago, while on cafeteria duty, I couldn't help but notice that several students owned the exact same t-shirt with print on the front that read, you laugh at me because I'm different, but I laugh at you because you're all the same. Now, I inwardly chuckled at the irony of all these brooding teenagers in, uh, trying to publicly announce to the world how unique they are with the same store-bought t-shirt. <laughs> in fact, the students themselves must have quickly become cognizant of the irony in the situation, for I rarely saw those shirts after the first couple weeks of school. But while I found the whole situation amusing, I also appreciated the sentiment behind their embarrassingly feeble attempts to establish their individuality. Many people want to stand out from the crowd, and many others tend to think of themselves as nonconformist. These students, who were in a stage in their lives when peer pressure is incredibly powerful and the desire to fit in is very great, were clearly thinking along these lines and trying to make a statement. However, the truth is that most people, as social beings, are in fact conformist, whether they are aware of the fact or not. We in God's church are really no different. The real question for us Christians to consider is what we are going to allow ourselves to be conformed to. Sadly, it is not unusual for me to see young people sacrifice their interests and true identities in an attempt to gather approval from other students or to gain acceptance into a clique. It is even sadder for me to see adults and organizations, including some churches, do the same thing to curry favor with the rest of society. From a Christian perspective, this is unfortunate because while we are in the world, we are not to be of the world, to paraphrase John chapter 17, verses 14 and 15. We are told this because Satan is the ruler of this world, as Christ tells us in John 12, verse 31. So what are the ramifications of Satan's position as the prince of the power of the air 
as Paul refers to him in Ephesians 2, 2. Well, it means that Satan is the main influencer of the ideals, values, and goals of the majority of people in every culture on the planet. Therefore, when we conform ourselves to this world, we are conforming ourselves to Satan's agenda, and we are moving away from God's plan for us. Perhaps there is no place where this is more apparent in our current age than in the realms of mass media, social media, and technology. When I look at the rapid moral decline of this country and other societies, I can't help but think that this decline has been accelerated by the advent of the internet and of ubiquitous entertainment options. This gives Satan almost unlimited access to reach people anytime, anywhere, with pernicious ideas that would have been considered unthinkable and uncivilized in previous generations. Now, I realize that technology can serve many wonderful purposes in our lives, and I'm not at all saying that it should be avoided and done away with altogether. However, it seems clear to me that many of our so-called advances have come with a heavy price, and I know that many of you feel the same way. When we accept that Satan is the ruler of this world and the prince of the power of the air, we also have to accept that he is able to manipulate the channels of communication used by people throughout the world to get the result he wants, which is to separate people from our creator. I see the corrosive effects of pervasive technology usage on our youth every school day. Some kids are plugged into devices 24-7, in the hallways, in the classroom, everywhere. And I've noticed a growing dependence upon them from students who struggle to function without them. For example, I've actually seen a high school student who pull out a cell phone to calculate what 6 plus 5 equals. (laughs) True story. (laughs) And many of my own students constantly try to plagiarize writing assignments because they refuse to think on their own. And some of them don't even do that successfully because they still don't know how to address the prompt or they take information about the wrong piece of literature. Uh, Just last month, I had them do a character analysis from uh, characters from The Devil and Tom Walker. It's a short story by Washington Irving. And there are only three characters and they just had to list like two characteristics per character. Several of my kids gave me characteristics from characters from The Adventures of Tom Sawyer because they went online. We read that story in class for two days straight and they didn't even know what story we read. So, but, you know, those are the challenges that we face in the modern age as, as teachers, I guess. But another troubling aspect of technology's effects on young people is the sense of isolation that seems to bring, that it seems to bring to many of the students. A large percentage of my students prefer burying their heads in a screen to interacting with one another, even when given a chance to work together on an assignment. Furthermore, while technology can be used to bring people together across distances, it can also be used to cyberbully others and drive people apart. Of course, the mere fact that young people spend hours upon hours watching useless TikTok videos or playing virtual games is a time drain itself and it keeps them from forming the types of relationships or pursuing the types of interests that are best developed in the company of others. Research confirms my anecdotal observations. A Cigna report based on a survey conducted in December 2021 showed that young adults between the ages of 18 and 24 were nearly twice as likely, 79% to 41%, than seniors age 66 or over to feel lonely. And this report notes that this is consistent with previous research. By the way, the same challenges posed to young people with technology often applies to adults too. There is an addictive quality to receiving likes online or being entertained on demand. And ironically, in this you know, increasingly interconnected world, many adults experience the same sense of isolation. This was obviously true during the pandemic, but studies have shown that the problem persists as the Roots of Loneliness Project cites that 52% of Americans feel lonely, while 47% claim their relationships with others are not meaningful, and 57% report eating all their meals alone. In case you were wondering, the same site mentions that by state, Ohio actually has the second lowest rate of loneliness in the nation, and that loneliness and its social isolation are less common among older adults who regularly attend religious services. So I'm sure this last fact is why the author of Hebrews encourages us to meet together, to stir up one another to love and good works in Hebrews uh, 10, uh, 24, and 25. That's where he stated that. And why John tells us that if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. And that's in 1 John 1, 7. Tony Ranke expands on this idea in his book, 12 Ways Your Phone is Changing You, 
which is an interesting book that I found at the public library. It looks at the effects of technology on us and our habits from a Christian perspective. As you might guess, the book warns against frivolous wasting, frivolously wasting our lives on the internet and allowing the tug of social media to take us away from God's intended purpose for us. The following page is from chapter three of his book, which uh, can be accessed actually on Google. So uh, let me put my glasses on while I read his thoughts on this. Ranke says, our online communities of like-minded friends are often marked by a positive feedback loop where affirmation and assent merely reinforce existing prejudices. In such contexts, communities become insular, echo chambers of accepted opinion closed to opposing views or to opposing voices, which means they breed a homeostatic stifling of difference. Communities that fail to embrace the benefits of disagreements and fail to work through tensions and differences tend to become homogenous and unhealthy because they tend to have exaggerated blind spots and unaddressed weaknesses. But perhaps, but perhaps we can press them further. Just as it's hard to grow together as a team when each player is preoccupied with individual performance and popularity, so too it's hard to grow as a family when children bring the hyper-approval climate of school into the home through their ubiquitous phones. Boring team meetings and boring family times are truly opportunities for personal growth in places of unconditional love, providing the soul a respite from the now unceasing demands of social approval. Maybe this is a key function of church attendance in the digital age. We must withdraw from our online worlds to gather as a body in our local churches. We gather to be seen, to feel awkward, and perhaps to feel a little unheard and underappreciated, all on purpose. In obedience to the biblical command not to forsake meeting together, we come as a one small piece, one individual member, one body part, in order to find purpose, life, and value in union with the rest of the living body of Christ. I also thought Mr. Reinke's wife had an insightful comment in page 101 of the book, where he quotes her as saying, compulsive social media habits are a bad trade. You, your present moment in exchange for an endless series of somebody else's past moments. Unfortunately, that is what I see all too often with the young and old alike, but especially the young, who often seem to know no other world than the one they create for themselves online. It's the most powerful conduit Satan has ever had to reach God's people. Unfortunately, I'm guilty of falling into this trap myself. I mean, just last month at the Winter Family Weekend, I was sitting in the lobby of a hotel looking, on, looking over online um, fantasy football updates rather than, <laughs> rather than fellowshipping and taking in the wonderful seminars uh, made available to us. In fact, even when I attended the seminars, I was only half listening as I tilted back and forth trying to put together a winning lineup for that weekend. Why did I do this? Well, because half of me wants to win money for my wife. <laughs> although I think she prefers when I lose so she can make fun of me. And the other half of my prideful self wants this little digital trophy that I can display in front of inferior fantasy football players. So you can see how easily our online amusements can become idols when we conform ourselves to the ways of this world, which might be why my team ended up crashing and burning that weekend even after I had an 80% chance of winning after that evening's games. Sometimes the most Christian and therefore, the most countercultural move is to just turn off the device and enjoy the moment you're in. So what are we to do since we all must live in the world? How can we avoid conforming to Satan's ways? Paul gives us some advice on how to do this in Romans 12, verses 1 and 2. If you'll turn with me there, if you want to take some time, I'll let them get that up on the screen, I hope. And this is what Paul had to say in Romans 12. Verses 1 and 2. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Peter expresses the same view in 1 Peter 1, verses 14 through 16 when he writes the following, 1 Peter 1, verses 14 through 16. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance, but as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in your conduct, since it is written, you shall be holy, 
for I am holy. Even centuries before Christ's birth, Psalm 1 tells us this. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of, or is like, uh, my own <laughs> anecdotal, uh, my own uh, words there to explain it. Nor stands in the way of, or is like sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. So you see, brethren, we are to be set apart from the rest of the world for God, a righteous remnant to serve as Christ's ambassadors here on earth. Does this mean that we are to give up everything we enjoy and live in solitary isolation? No, of course not. We can still enjoy the pleasures of life, such as God's wonderful creation, for example. And the resurrected Christ himself instructed his disciples to go into the world to preach the gospel in Mark 16, verse 15. Yet, we are not to become part of the world in the sense that we are not to adopt its ways and mix its standards with God's standards. Rather than blending into the darkness, we should adhere to the words in Ephesians 5, verses 8 through 10. And this is what Paul had to say in Ephesians. Uh, Ephesians 5, verses 8 through 10. For at one time you were darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light, for the, light of, for the fruit of light is found in all that is good and right and true. And try to discern what is pleasing to the Lord. To walk as children of light, as Paul puts it, we are to avoid those things that displease the Lord. Paul lists many of them in 1 Corinthians 6, verses 9 through 11. So let's read those verses too. Uh, 1 Corinthians 6, verses 9 through 11. Or do you not know what wrong do you not know that wrongdoers will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor slanderers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And that is what some of you were. But you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ by the Spirit of our God. In these lines to the Corinthian church, Paul clearly discusses what behaviors converted Christians are to avoid, while also making clear that God's kingdom is available to anyone who is willing to give up these sinful activities and turn to Jesus Christ. The immoral behaviors listed here are the practices of Satan's kingdom. But if we want to inherit the kingdom of God, we must avoid them and practice the fruits of the Spirit, which we learn in Galatians 5, verses 22 and 23, are love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. This may mean giving up certain forms of unwholesome entertainment or dressing differently than you used to do. In fact, it may mean acting, speaking, and thinking completely differently from your peers. But if we are truly to be lights to the world, we must stand out in other ways. And when you carry yourself as a Christian in speech, in appearance, and deed, believe me, you will stand out. It's not the slovenly, malcontented teenager or adult roaming around using monosyllabic curse words that makes an impression. They're a dime a dozen, products of a broken culture and often broken families. No, it's the intelligent, well-spoken, nicely attired person who makes a favorable impression with their peers so that they will be known by their good fruits and will be a blessing to those around them. Likewise, we are to be wary of and distance ourselves from those who bear bad fruit as described by Jesus in Matthew 7, verses 15 through 20. So again, if we can turn there, that's a larger section. Matthew 7, verses 15 through 20. We'll read those verses. Watch out for false prophets. They come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ferocious wolves. By their fruit you will recognize them. Do people pick grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Likewise, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, and a bad tree cannot bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus, by their fruit, you will recognize them. Christ describes cutting down the bad trees and throwing them in the fire to get rid of them, and we are to purge the bad trees from our lives in a similar fashion. Some people fear that living for the Lord in this way or separating ourselves from the world means that they must give up their individuality. But this is not so. Psalms 139, 
Psalm 139, verses 13 and 14, tell us that we have been fearfully and wonderfully made in our mother's womb. And Jeremiah, chapter 1, verse 5, tells us, well, the Lord actually told Jeremiah in that verse, that he had been set apart and appointed as a prophet before he was born. God knows how special you are, and he has given you gifts that will allow you to become a uniquely important member of the body of Christ if you take his yoke upon yourself and learn from him. However, this does not mean that you can expect to enter God's kingdom without endeavoring to change. As we noted in, earlier in Romans 12, a transformation must take place because the ways of the flesh are sinful. We not only must avoid being conformed to this world, but we must also become conformed to the mind of Christ. Someone who knew the power of being a transformational nonconformist well was Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. He reportedly gave many sermons on the topic in his ministry. ministry. Since the nation recognized his contributions to the civil rights movement with a federal holiday earlier this month, it seemed appropriate to share some of his thoughts about nonconformity with you. The following words are from a sermon he delivered in November of 1954. King said, Nonconformity is creative when it is controlled and directed by a transformed life and is constructive when it embraces a new mental outlook. By opening our lives to God and Christ, we become new creatures. This experience, which Jesus spoke of as a new birth, is essential if we are to be transformed nonconformist and freed from the cold hard-heartedness and self-righteousness so often characteristic of nonconformity. Someone has said, I love reforms, but I hate reformers. A reformer may be an untransformed nonconformist whose rebellion against the evils of society has left him annoyingly rigid and unreasonably impatient. Only through an inner spiritual transformation do we gain the strength to fight vigorously the evils of the world in a humble and loving spirit. The transformed nonconformist, moreover, never yields to the passive sort of patience that is an excuse to do nothing. And this very transformation saves him from speaking irresponsible words that estrange without reconciling and from making hasty judgments that are blind to the necessity of social progress. He recognizes that social change will not come overnight, yet he works as though it is an imminent possibility. Will becoming a trans no transformed nonconformist, as Martin Luther King Jr. would call it, make you more popular in society and among your peers? We have every reason to believe that it will not. King and his supporters were, were reviled across the South by segregationists before King himself was assassinated. Nearly all 12 of the Apostles of Christ were executed, and only divine intervention saved the one who wasn't killed. And Jesus Christ himself, the very Son of God, received an unjust and torturous death at the hands of God's own chosen people. Christ told us that this would be the case in John 15, verses 18 and 19. And we'll take a look at those verses as well. John 15, verses 18 and 19. Where Christ said the following. If the world hates you, know that it has hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love you as its own. But because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. We can take solace in knowing that if we are shunned, oppressed, canceled, or even violently harmed for our beliefs. We are walking in the same paths Jesus and the disciples trod. As, Christ, as Christ explains in Matthew 5, verse 10, blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. We are called to be nonconformist, but the type of nonconformity we are to practice is not the shallow type of self-exhibitionism displayed by the students in the cafeteria that I referred to earlier in the sermon. Once again, I have been guilty of doing the same things myself. I used to wear t-shirts that were nothing short of obscene or offensive to anyone with a sense of decency for the purpose of drawing attention to myself and getting a rise out of others. I guess I thought I was pretty funny. Uh, <laughs> at least until I wore a shirt that said, it must suck to be you on it, to, to my friend Mandy's house. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, those were the types of, uh, I had worse ones than that, believe me. Now, 
This time I wore that shirt to Mandy's house, though. I'll, I'll never forget. Mandy had a younger sister who suffered from a physical disability. She could not walk or barely walk. And I, as I passed by her with the shirt on, she said, it does suck to be me. That shirt didn't seem quite as funny anymore. But I was so self-absorbed that I would continue to wear the shirt anyway afterward. This is not the behavior of someone who shares the mind of Christ. And I look back on my attitude and actions with a sense of shame and regret, although I know God has forgiven me for my youthful indiscretions. In fact, he has had to forgive me for bigger mistakes than those. But I see now that I was conforming myself to what other, non to what other conformists, such as my friends, thought was edgy and cool. Instead of, being edgy and, instead of being cool and standing out for the right reasons, what I was really doing was just being a self-aggrandizing jerk who was rebelling against God's standards of decorum and proper living. Satan was probably well pleased with the attitude I displayed back then. Brethren, rather than being self-idolizing golden calves forged in Satan's influence by our own corrupt human natures, we are to be the lights of the world. Shining cities on hills meant to suffer, meant to offer refuge, not suffer, meant to offer refuge for those seeking a way out of the darkness of Satan's heathenistic societies or morally bankrupt cultures. So let your lights shine brightly and don't be afraid to be the transformative nonconformist you were made to be.